my name is Steve Byers. I'm speaking to you from Olympia, Washington. It's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague Bob Stilger. Bob is the founder and co-president of New Stories, a nonprofit that uses the power of story to help people create thriving, resilient communities. After leading a local community development corporation for 25 years, Bob work is more, Bob's work more recently has stretched in many parts of the world, including Japan, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Brazil, and Australia. He was co-president of the Burkana Institute from 2005 to 2009, and he now teaches both at St. Mary's College of California and at Gonzaga University in Spokane. He holds a PhD in learning and change in human systems from the California Institute of Integral Studies. And since 2010, he's done extensive work in Japan, introducing collaborative spaces called Future Sessions, as well as many participatory leadership processes. AG Press of Tokyo will publish Calling Communities Back to Life in Japanese in the fall of 2014. So again, my pleasure to welcome Bob Stilker. Well, it's wonderful to be here with you this morning. I have to say this this technology is kind of interesting. I'm, I'm actually sitting here in a small motel room near the San Francisco airport staring out a window that looks out on the Caltrain station. Uh, um, so it's, I'm, in my imagination I'm seeing a group of, of, of friends and colleagues and it's good to, good to join you. I want to start by just taking us back um, a little more than three years ago to March 11th, 2011, around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's when a quake of more than 9.0 magnitude uh, um, struck about 75 miles off the, off the coast of Tohoku, Japan, in the northeast of Japan. About 45 minutes after that, uh, uh, the first of, of two tidal waves hit. The second tidal wave was the big one. It was one that sent water rushing in at a height of more than 60 feet uh, at more than 50 miles an hour. And in a matter of minutes, 500,000 people were without homes or without jobs or both. Around 20,000 lost their lives. The next day, the the nuclear reactors started exploding at Fukushima and more destruction was created. It was a pretty amazing time. I wasn't in Japan at the time. I was back in the United States. In 2010, I'd spent a lot of time in Japan uh, introducing art of hosting, uh, working with people in Japan to develop what's become a movement around future centers and, uh, uh, and future sessions. Many things that happened in 2010, as we look back on it, seemed like they were preparatory for what was needed in 2011. I also add that my own relationship with Japan started more than 40 years before that, when I, when I went to Japan as a, as a student in 1970. Um, I met the grandfather of my heart. Uh, I began to develop my own spiritual path. Japan has been an important part of, of who I am for uh, uh, well, for a, lot, for a long time, uh, and then the disasters happened. What happened to me sitting in Spokane was this immediate sense that I wanted to support people in the Tohoku region in creating the future that they wanted, rather than simply having government come in and rebuild the past. That intention has been the one that's guided me for the last three years. And it's been an amazing, uh, an amazing story. Three weeks after the disasters, uh, I was in Tokyo. And, you know, the first thing that started happening is that people started coming together. We started asking this question. Well, we actually didn't have this question yet. We didn't have the question of, how can disaster be a springboard for thriving, resilient communities? What we had was this over, overwhelming sense of, of loss. You know, Japan is a, it's a collective culture. Uh, uh, empathy is, is uh, one of the, the key 
mm, key flow systems within the culture. So even though the disaster hit in the northeast region of Japan, the disaster was felt throughout the country uh, uh, at, at multiple levels. And the first thing that happened is that people started coming together and started meeting with each other, started talking, started trying to say, what, you know, what do we do now? I always use as a reference point one particular meeting that happened in, in downtown Tokyo in, in early April. As Steve mentioned, uh, I've been involved with the Future Center movement in Japan. And in 2010, we started that movement. And we'd planned this meeting for early April, asking people to come together and, and, and think about what's, uh, what shall we do in 2011. We almost canceled the meeting. We weren't sure that it was right. But then we realized that it was even more right than it had been before. People started arriving. And it's almost impossible to describe what it was like then, even in Tokyo. The, the best words that I've come up with is that there was a thickness in the air. It was, it was actually hard to move. The air was so thick. And so people are coming in and they, they still, even though it's been three weeks since this horrific event happened, mostly they haven't talked about it to anyone, including their families. There were no words. People didn't know how to talk about what had happened. So they're arriving, and they're arriving in a, in a kind of space for a kind of purpose where they know they're going to have to talk. And they're really not sure that they want to be there. And they're really not sure that they want to talk. But they said they'd come, and they've come. Three hours later, that, that room was, was filled with, with waku waku. It's one of my favorite words in Japanese. Waku waku means excitement. And that, that shift, that shift from this incredibly thick air to this excitement in just a three-hour period of time was amazing. And I, and I had to step away. I had to step away to, to just try and sense into what, you know, what the hell has happened here. And as I did that, these words, loud voice pops into my head that we've been released from a future we did not want. That was the amazing impact, even beyond the destruction. That was the amazing impact of 311. The sense of having been released from a future we did not want. The sense of, huh, we can let go of the fact that, you know, we're, we're, we're living lives that are not very satisfactory. We're not real happy. Stress is high. Lots of things are going on that we don't understand. And maybe we don't have to just keep doing the same thing. Maybe we can actually do something different for a change. That's the energy that I've worked with and that many of us have worked with for the last three years. You know, I'd like to say that I'd like to say that things got clear after that, and they didn't. It's been an incredibly messy, chaotic time. I think one of the most important things that I've learned is how tightly braided intention and surrender are. In almost everything that I've done, I've had that clarity of intention about how do we support people in Tohoku in creating the future that they want. And I've had to surrender time and time and time again in terms of how that intention manifests itself in the world. I think that's been true for many of us. And now, you know, people ask, so what's going on now? In many ways, much of Japan on the surface is still trying to step back into the old normal. The current political leadership, the current government will likely get the laws passed that lead to startup of most of the nuclear reactors. That's kind of on a hairline right now with, with about half of the country saying yes and half of the country saying no. But even just under that, under beneath that surface, there's something different that's going on. 
people are are stepping forward in some new ways the sense of relationships and relational fields being much more critical the material prosperity is one of the things that's running but I have to say the dominant story outside of parts of the disaster area is one that's moving back to that old normal in the disaster area itself the two areas where that's different are the coastal areas where the tsunamis hit and Fukushima and in both of those cases there is no old normal the old normal is irrevocably gone it's not coming back and so in those areas there's a much different uh, spirit of, of we have to do something new we don't know what it is and we better get on with discovering what that might be in this work of transforming communities one of the forms that we have we've really been working with is is what I'll call an expanded form of future centers future centers are a a, 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 a process a methodology an idea developed starting about 15 years ago in Europe and in 2009 a group called Knowledge Dynamics Initiative at Fuji Xerox which had been doing knowledge management work in Japan for about 15 years started looking around and saying you know this knowledge management stuff that we're doing it's interesting but it actually doesn't seem like it leads to change and they looked out they saw future centers from Europe and said that might be a starting point we might be able to do something with that here so in 2010 uh, ideas around future centers start being brought into Japan in 2010 my work with art of hosting conversations that matter using dialogue for collaboration also came into Japan we merged the two and we started out of that creating what future centers in Japan might look like and what I want to talk uh, talk about a little bit today is is like how does how does this how does this this work with future centers how does it get put into a system that actually has the potential of leading to community transformation what are the different arenas what are the steps what are the stages what are the parts that we need to pay attention to one of the things that I've become very aware of is that in so much of this work we you know we come along and we do one thing and the one thing that we do doesn't work and then we get discouraged or we wait for a while and we try one more thing again and still not very much happens the question for me is one of how do we begin to create more robust and complete systems that help us in transforming community so as we've as we've worked with that question in Japan and I'm gonna I'm gonna give one one aspect of this model uh, uh, over the next several minutes and then take a take the first pause for questions uh, but as we've worked with this model in Japan what we've seen is that we actually need a variety of kinds of spaces that that first of all and we need those spaces where it's possible for people to come together and share their grief and to share their dreams and share their possibilities this one be this it, this is this is so critically important you know, I think that in, in 2011, almost all of the work that was going on was really around creating spaces that allowed this sharing of grief and working with the power of grief rather than holding in grief and sharing dreams, sharing, you know, now that we're in that we've been released from a future that we did not want, what's possible? What can we do? How do we move ahead? those spaces of sharing grief and possibilities often quickly lead to spaces of taking local action where people come together and say you know we have to do something so if we're if we're in the immediacy of disaster the purpose of those local actions is is very clear there's work that has to be done at the at the level of rescue there's work at the level of shelter of providing food of cleaning up the mess of at least getting us back to the bare ground that we can work on and once we've done that then the local action becomes in the arenas of, of so how are we how are we going to feed ourselves how are we going to create alternative energy systems what are we going to do now to care for our growing elderly population what kind of businesses do we believe in 
what are the businesses that we can create now with the kind of resource base that we have, which is different than the resource base that we used to have. So one of the next things that starts to happen in future sessions, or the next kind of future session that we start to call, are the future sessions that are around taking local action, where people who care about the same things come together to be with each other and to begin to explore what's possible. As those local actions start to become more clear, one of the next things that we've that we've noticed and that we've been working on in Tohoku is that we have to start creating translocal systems. We have to create the conditions that allow those people who are working on food issues or energy issues or elderly issues or working with our children, that we need to create the means that allow them to come together and share practice and share learning with each other so that they can go on and begin to begin to go beyond local change to create transformation. Part of the model that we've worked in for, with Burkana and now New Stories for many years is that all change is local and that all transformation happens when we create the connections between those local changes so that they share learning and practice and are able to go to a, a larger systems level. As we continue doing that work, one of the things that, that just became very clear is that it, it's so easy to simply have these the, the, these different kinds of work going on within isolated isolated silos. We need actually to begin to create more complete stories of the future that we want. We need to have some place that all of these individual actions begin to land and begin to be part of an overall scenario for the future. Another way that we've talked about this at Burkana is the question of how do we create systems of influence. I think that the, the work that, that Adam Kahane has done on transformative scenario planning is one example of how we create systems of influence. Question is, what are the others? Uh, you know, so I look at things like Nosa Sao Paulo that uh, a number of years ago launched a civic initiative that was based on requiring the city of Sao Paulo to come up with indicators of success. That was all. They said to the city, we need you to come up with the indicators that you're using to guide your actions to create success in this community. Or in South Africa in 2008, 2009, there was a reality TV program that was developed where the 10 different townships were empowered to go out and use basically asset-based community development to improve their townships in what became the most popular television program in South Africa in 2009. We need to do the work that helps us envision an overall story of where we're trying to go in order for those local actions to have some place to, to cohere. The next kind of future session and future center that, that we've been using in Japan are those places where we deepen learning. Uh, uh, part, of what, part of what we're seeing is that, you know, especially especially with the clarity that the disaster areas give. This is long-term work. And unless we begin to develop the, the places that allow people doing that work to come together and share their learning with each other, share their questions, share their leading edges, share their uncertainties, it's impossible for the work to, to go further. It's impossible for the work to deepen unless we're creating the structures that allow that deepening of learning. You know, and I, I have to add in that I think this is one of the one of the key reasons that the Alia community itself has been so important to me over the last ten years is that the Alia community has been one of those oases where people have come to deepen and share their learning, come together because we're out there, we're out there doing all of these different things, whether it's in in government or in community or a nonprofit sector. Most of the time we're feeling fairly isolated and fairly alone and we have to come together someplace first of all simply to remember we're not crazy and secondly to actually begin to learn how to do what we're doing better Alia has been one of those oases we're creating more of those oases in Japan and as we create them we're typically we're creating them within different networks where there's where there's a, a there's a there's a pre-existing sense of connection that we can build on. 
I'm going to take a pause in just a second and see what questions some of this may have provoked so far. What we've been noticing in Japan is that we need to be thinking about all five of these levels all the time. The grief doesn't go away. The need for local action doesn't go away. The need to create translocal systems doesn't go away. The need to continually envision what's the overall story we want to create here doesn't go away. And the need to deepen our learning doesn't go away. So we need to keep returning to all five of these if we have a chance of creating a more robust system. This is, I gotta say, this is just a little bit weird staring at my computer screen saying all these things. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing some, some questions and would even love hearing some more voices about how, how this is landing and what it may be stimulating in you. Of uh, the technology that we have. Uh, this has been fantastic, Bob. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, a question that I, that I personally have in listening to this is that how do you, uh, you mentioned working with the power of grief. How do you work with the power of grief without getting lost in it? You know, I think that's probably something that we fear before we're willing to enter into the grief. I don't see people getting lost in grief. What I experience is that when, when we create a space that invites grief in, where people feel that it's possible to, to, to share that part of themselves, that, that actually what happens is that there's a, there's a speaking, there's a sharing, there's a dwelling, and then it passes. It will come back again. And the amount of time that one stays in the grief is it can't be predicted in advance. But simply holding the space for that grief to be spoken, not to be fixed, not to be maximized, not to be minimized, but simply to invite it to walk freely in the room, releases power. It allows people to step more deeply into their power. And the way that, you know, and, and it's like the, there's this way in which Grief and possibility, grief and joy, excuse me, grief and joy are twinned with each other. I first experienced this in, the, in, in a deep way in Zimbabwe, where one of the things that I noticed was that when, when, when deep grief would be spoken into a circle, the speaking of that deep grief would be, would be followed by silence. And out of that silence, at at some point in time, someone would begin to sing. And, and the singing, and others would join in, and the singing would take that grief and hold that grief with incredible respect and tenderness and would spin it back up out of the room. And, and, the, and the energy that was present was one of, ah, oh, okay, I can go forward now. What, what's essential is having that space where the grief can be let out, where it can be spoken. I remember not, you know, now, what, 10 years ago, uh, uh, being at a place not far from where I am right now, Pema Osaling, where Lama Tarchin was giving a Dharma, Dharma talk, and he talked about grief, and he talked about how Grief is, so, grief is like red meat. If you eat it right away, it's incredibly sweet. But if you leave it around, 
it starts to smell. And if you leave it around even longer, it starts to attract maggots. So eat your grief right away because it's a sweet, sweet taste. And that's the, you know, that's the sense that I think is present here. When, we, when we're not afraid of grief, but when we see it as a key ally in our own transformation, when we're able to go ahead and be in a space that allows us to breathe it through, it's incredibly powerful and incredibly important. Yeah, it really makes me also think about how different cultures have ways of dealing with grief and that we've been, um, for many people in more Western cultures, we've been sort of um, cut off from healthy ways of dealing with grief. So this is uh, it's a, perhaps a very good invitation for that. Okay, so we have another question here, <clears throat> which I believe was from Jennifer. and. Uh, it's changing. Hold on a second. Okay. What have you learned uh, that would help us respond to more disasters like climate change? It's actually one of my big questions. Um, you know, it's like, it's two parts. Um, first part is, really, do we have to wait? You know, could we just go ahead and recognize now that we're already in hot enough water and do something about it? Uh, and and that one for me continues to be a big I don't know I don't know if we can but what I'm willing to predict is that because of climate change as well as because of the, the, the brittleness of so many other systems that we have a huge practice ground in front of us the only thing that I'll predict about the future is that we're going to have more disasters and more collapsing systems and we better figure out how we can use that energy as a springboard to create what we want rather than just simply be lost afterwards. So mm -hmm. I'm actually seeing the core of my work over the next 10 years or so, uh, or the, the rest of the time that I'm willing to work as much as I do now, uh, uh, being in this territory of, uh, of working with what happens after disaster. There is, you know, go back to that egg that I used in the beginning slide. There is a cracking open that happens. There is, it's not so much what people in Japan talk about is, is it's not so much a, a shift of consciousness as it is a deep remembering, a deep remembering about what's important. Talk with so many people who've said, you know, it's not like the way that I see my life and the way I see the world shifted because of the disaster. But it's, I actually return to it. I actually return to some things that were already uh, uh, deeply alive inside of me. And, and the question that then comes is, it's once again, how do we create the spaces that actually allow people to step into that, that remembering that they have around what they want to create? And part of what, part of what I believe is that we've got we've to develop the capacity in communities to create spaces that bring people together to, to do all five of the things that are on this slide. Uh, and we have to be able to do that on a continual basis. So we've got, you know, part of the preparation, I think, is whether we call them impact hubs, or we call them future centers, or we call them transition towns, or whatever mean that we're using, we need to begin create, consciously creating both the physical spaces and the and the social spaces that allow us to come together and talk with each other about what it is that we're going to create now. I, one of my questions in the last, I've been back in the U.S. For, for almost a month. I'll be headed back to Japan next week, and I've done a little bit of a tour of, of both Cedar Rapids, uh, um, where there was a a scouring flood in 2008 that the, the community is still rebuilding from and will be rebuilding from for many, many years. Uh, uh, and then time in Appalachia with the, with the slower disaster of mountaintop removal and coal. And in both cases, the sense that the people there have is that they need to be, they, they, they need to take their work 
which has been in many in many ways it's been sort of that that first stage work of grief and early preparation and doing some good things getting some good things out there but they but they happen as just these isolated good things and it's wonderful that that's happened and you can call that prototyping call it whatever you will but it's actually we're at a point where we need to be able to take those good things that are happening and we need to help them cohere with a larger story and with a larger supporting structure so I think what we've got to do is that or no, I shouldn't say we've got to do I think the opportunity that presents itself is that after disaster hits maybe even before but after disaster hits we need to be creating the kind of social spaces that support communities in defining and acting on what's the word I want defining and acting on the taking the actions that will create the communities that they want there is an opening that happens we've got to learn how to use it mm -hmm. right thank you and we have another question here from Jacqueline I'm interested in hearing more about building on pre-existing connections how deep do these connections need to be in order to create a foundation of, for your work? Can you repeat? I, I had a train come by. Can sure. you repeat the first part of the question oh. again? <laughs> sure. It's, I'm interested in hearing more about building on pre-existing connections. Ah. How deep do these connections need to be in order to create a foundation for your work? Hmm. It's a really interesting question. And I have two, two answers uh, or two responses and they'll go in, in, in opposite directions. Uh, um, the question makes me think of the, uh, the village of, of Sawa uh, uh, in Minami San Riku, which was a village with 188 households that was totally destroyed in the tsunami and when temporary housing was being allocated in Japan and so the stages were people people who lost their homes went into emergency shelters uh, in in March of 2011 and the incredible news is that by August of 2011 uh, there was actually emergency housing temporary housing that was available to, to for everyone to move to the government used a system in allocating that temporary housing in many areas of a lottery because their top priority was fairness. What happened though was the people who had already been isolated from those they were connected to in these temporary housing settlements were further separated through that lottery and dispersed miles and miles and miles apart. In Sawa, when there was one guy who was a ship's engineer from Nagoya who'd grown up in Sawa and who had returned home a couple of years before to retire, he noticed that he and two other people from Sawa were assigned to the same temporary housing village. He went and he talked to them really quickly and he said, maybe, maybe we could get everybody from Sawa together in, in the same temporary housing. And they went to the government and the miracle was the government officials said, well, I guess so. And they started creating certificates. And they actually managed to bring everyone from Sawa together into this one temporary housing. And they were connected. You know, they may have they, they may have been pissed off at each other, or there may have been your great grandmother and my great grandfather were angry with each other and, and we still have that between us. But they had relationship, they had connection. And the temporary housing was think of uh, uh, think of low cost uh, 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 double wide trailers. That's what the temporary housing was in these long rows, mm -hmm. very lonely, uh, uh, very very stark, uh, uh, built very quickly, uh, which was really important, uh, uh, but very stark. And because people in Sawa had connection with each other, you know, one of the first things they said was, "Well, wouldn't it be nice if we built some porches?" out over our front doors so we had some place that we could sit and some place where we could take off our shoes and so they did that and then one of the next things they said is well 
you know, we, we really ought to be growing our own food. Uh, and so they started doing that. And then they said, you know, we should be taking care of our security. And they started doing that. And, and by the time October rolled around, they said, you know, even though this has been an incredibly hard year, we have so much to celebrate that they organized a village festival. By December of 2011, they went to the nonprofit that had been supporting them and said, thank you very much for your help. We're okay. Others needed more. All, and and this, is, this was not what was happening in most of the other temporary housing <clears throat> areas. So that connection that they had with each other gave them a starting point, gave them a place to begin to weave community together. So that's one. But the other one is that you know, what, I've seen, what I've seen happen is that when people come together who don't know each other in a gracious space, where there's clarity of purpose for why we've been called together and where there's a certain sense of, of urgency and timeliness around that purpose, that there's this, there is this, this human yearning to be in authentic relationship with each other. And when we create the spaces that allow that authentic relationship to emerge, connection happens quickly and people, people are able to trust. They'll trust as much as they can, and if their experience that grows out of that trust is a positive one, they'll trust more and more. But what we have to do is we have to create the kind of ba, excuse me, Japanese word, uh, the kind of, of relational space that, that supports that sort of coming together with each other. I want to go back to that first story that I told about that meeting in, in Tokyo in early April that led to the, we have been released from the future we did not want. You know, I've, I've told that story many times, but it was, it was just a couple weeks ago when I was doing an Art of Hosting participatory leadership in, in Maine that I realized one piece I'd always left out. There was a reason. There was a reason that we went from the, from the, from the, the thick air at the beginning of that meeting to the waku waku, the excitement three hours later. And the reason was because of the kind of space that we hosted. We very intentionally created a space that invited people together to begin to see who each other were. And, and that really, oops, that's not the screen I want to share. Oh, I love technology. There we go. Uh, um, you know, so part of what, I want to make sure this is the right one. There we go. No, I'm gonna, I want to go beyond this for a second. We'll come back to this. So part of, what, part of what we do, what we have to do when we're working with people who aren't connected with each other is that we begin by building relationships. We begin by, by, by having people coming together at, at, at smaller levels of systems and twos and threes and, and sharing their stories with each other and, and beginning to see that you know, this person that I've just sat down with that I have absolutely no connection with whatsoever, that, there, that there's a resonance in their story and my story. And there's, a, there's a resonance that comes out of the, the shared experience that we have as well as our different lives. So that, that when we're working in situations where people are not connected with each other, we start with building relationships. Once we've built relationships, we use that as the basis to begin to establish trust. We begin to, to invite people to, to play with each other in which in a way that, that, that they naturally share more of the story of who they are. And as they share more of the story of who they are, there's an openness to hearing and receiving the story of who someone else is. So we consciously work to help people share their stories with each other in a way that helps them build trust. And, and we go from there to saying, okay, you know, this is all right. You know, I may not know who you are. I may not be connected with you yet, but I trust you enough to begin to share some of my precious ideas. You know, I think, I suspect that because of what you've said to me and what I've said to you, that you're not just going to dump on whatever it is that I say, that you'll actually listen. And that in your listening, I might be able to discover more of, more of what it is that I actually need. So, 
the next stage that we see that takes place in a in a future session is we begin to share ideas with each other and it's ideas and it's dreams and it's it's possibilities that we're sharing we're actually sharing ourselves and what it is that we're hoping and the kinds of things that 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 hope how we how we how we image how we imagine that hope when we do that you know one of the things that then comes up is it the, the, the questions of how you know okay if that was what we wanted to create if if this dream of you know all right the the, the soil in the soil in Fukushima is contaminated when we remove the contaminated soil we have no topsoil left we're not going to be able to grow food in the way that we used to grow food but I've, I've heard this idea I've heard this idea about aquaponics I've heard this idea about hydroponics maybe Fukushima becomes the the leader in Japan and in the world for how we grow food without using soil well gee if we're going to do that then we need to gather information we need to go out we need to we need to use the web we need to use learning journeys we need to we need to go and talk to people in universities we need to do whatever it takes to begin gathering the information that will help us take those ideas and bring them into form when we gather enough of that information then what we do is we create prototypes and you know it was actually Otto Scharmer and, and, and Theory U that brought the word prototype back into my vocabulary about 10 years ago. And I love it because what it says is that we have to try stuff. You know, we don't have to, we don't have to know how everything is going to work, but we have to have gathered enough information to be able to come up with the experiment that we're willing to undertake to see if it works, to see if it happens, to discover what does happen so that we've got some we've got some concrete material to work with that, that we can then use to go one step further and and when we create those prototypes oops part of what we do is we communicate those results we're not you know it's like I think sometimes in this country we, we have such a fear of failure uh, uh, that whenever we do something and it doesn't work out exactly the way we had hoped that our tendency is to hide it and let as few people know as possible because they won't they won't believe us they won't invest in us and actually part of what's going on is that we know that we don't have relationship and we don't have trust so we start to hide but what's actually important if we're trying to create an overall system of transformation is we go from creating those prototypes to communicating our results into wider and wider circles of people because that's part of what helps us uh, um, helps us build something that actually works and I noticed that our time is is running a little bit short but I, I so I just want to back up see if I can make technology work for me in the way I want it to <clears throat> because as we're doing this these kinds of, of future sessions which are at one level they're really you know they, they are, I, I got off on this by the question about uh, how important is it to be connected it's the more we're connected the more this cycle of building relationship and establishing trust is in some ways shortcutted. We can't shortcut it entirely because in any pre-existing community where there is connection, it doesn't mean there's trust. In fact, in pre-existing systems where there is connection, the, the, the mixture of trust and distrust is usually extraordinarily high because we, 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 we grow out of our suspicions of each other and the stories that we make up out about each other rather than actually encountering each other as we are so we need this whole cycle even in places where there is pre-existing connection and the other thing that I just want to seed in is that this work in a in a future session itself is part of a larger system and that larger system mean it, it includes at least six different dimensions that we, be, we, we begin by imagining, we begin by, by coming together and, and thinking about what else is possible. We follow that imagining by, de, by deciding who it is that we want to invite in, who are the people that, that we think are, are likely to be attracted to that imagination, who represent the many diverse aspects of community and system that are essential for the work that we want to do we bring together we bring those people together into a future system and we engage and that's what we call 
you know, it's what we call a future session or we call a future center. When we do that work of engagement, it's always important. And this is one that I think many of us have been learning and practicing with for, for a number of years now. It's important when we're doing that engagement to continually harvest what's happening in the engagement, in the future session, harvest it within the room, harvest it so we're making what's going on in all of the parts of the room visible to the whole room. <clears throat> what we don't do as well right now in, in many places that I've worked in is we don't take that harvest and use it as a, as a starting point to make the learning, to make the discovery, to make the inquiries that have taken place in that room visible to a larger system. We have to make it larger to a visible system because we're trying to grow something here. So it's the visibility that we create that allows us to invite in another level of connection. It allows us to, to connect out to other systems and other people and to invite them in this continuing cycle of imagining, inviting, engaging, harvesting, making visible, and connecting. Those, those three dimensions that I've, that I've been hitting on, the kinds of spaces, these, uh, these stages of engagement, and what we do when we're actually together in the room, these three levels are the three levels that, that, that I've been experimenting and working with in Japan that seem to be part of the key for creating a robust system of participation that allows people to begin to create the future that they want. Uh, um, and we started a little bit late, uh, uh, and we're now at the point in time where uh, we're going to take a, a bit of a bit of a segue. Coming up towards the the top of the hour, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, stay on with with whoever. Uh, uh, is available and interested uh, uh, to continue dialoguing around these issues. Uh, um, but I want to, uh, first what I need to do is just kind of breathe myself. Uh, um, hmm. Obviously, I think this work is really important. I believe that we're in a time when, we're, when we are going to continue to see the collapse of many of the systems that have sustained us in the past. How that will happen, where it will happen, when it will happen, I don't know. But I do know that we need to develop more capacity and more muscle to use those collapses as a starting point to create what we want. And this is not this is not a uh, this is not a one uh, a one event one stop one time process. We actually need to learn how to think of this as our life work and to think of the many dimensions that are involved in doing that life work. So I want to I want to thank you for uh, uh, for coming this morning and and sharing this time with me. Uh, I I hope that that many of you will be coming to the Summer Institute uh, in Tacoma in June. It's another place where where we play with all of these kinds of ideas. It's another one of those oases for our coming together to deepen our learning. And I'm going to to, to hand it back to to Steve. Uh, uh, and we'll do a bit of a pause after that and then continue. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Bob, for that really powerful presentation. And uh, I know that there's much more to come uh, at the Summer Institute. Uh, just for a quick reference here, here's a couple of websites uh, related to Bob's current work, uh, newsstories.org and resilientjapan.org. Uh, we also have one more uh, terrific webinar coming up. Uh, which is uh, featuring Art Kleiner in a couple of weeks, May 14th, and he'll be talking about uh, building collective mastery in organizations. And of course, Art will be at the Summer Institute as well, or Summer Intensive. And just to look at a few of the uh, hosts that will be featured at the Summer Leadership Intensive, 
Uh, we have some regulars and we have some new folks. I'm very excited about uh, Charles Eisenstein and Dan Siegel and Darcy Winslow will be there uh, from the Academy for Systemic Change and of course the Shambhala Arts team uh, which really brings a, a level of richness to this uh, event that makes it like no other event. And one other thing that's very uh, cool about the Summer Leadership Intensive is that we have a number of case studies. Uh, Bob's uh, will be among them. Uh, here's a couple others. Uh, they're, they're fascinating studies of, of uh, work that's going on right now. You'll be working or talking with people that are, are your peers in the world uh, doing work like you do. And there's a, a great deal of learning to uh, be had here. In these conversations so we look forward uh, to these as well and I'm happy now to uh, turn it back to Adrian and Bob for uh, extended conversation for those of you that uh, have time to hang on and listen to Bob a little longer well hopefully listen to all of us a little longer Great. Thank you so much, Steve, and thank you, Bob. For those of you who are going to be joining us in this next section, ne next session, uh, feel free to, if you're on a computer, just raise your hand if you have anything that you want to share or any questions that perhaps came up during the last time, um, or during the session that weren't answered yet, and we'd love to hear from you in your own voice. Okay, here there is one from Jacqueline. So let's just unmute you. Welcome, Jacqueline. Yes, hi there. Um, Bob, I was interested uh, in a comment you very briefly made about doing some of this work maybe before a disaster strikes, um, not waiting for the collapse. Um, and I wondered what you had in mind there, you know, what might be some of the opportunities you saw for this work in, in that context. You know, I think that that's the work that many of us are engaged in right now. And I use some, probably because I've been working with them over the last couple of weeks, I would use the transition town movement in the United States and all around the world as one example uh, of where where people are saying, gee, you know, we're not we're not quite living the way that we want to live. And I think in the United States, uh, uh, peak oil has been one of the one of the drivers behind the, the transition movement. But in other parts of the world, also what's happening is people are simply coming together saying, we want to be in community in ways differently than the ways we've been in the past. And so they come together, they come together, and they start uh, uh, often start concentrating on developing systems of local currency, developing systems of local food, developing systems of local energy, developing better systems for educating children. They say that these are things that we as a community need to take responsibility for. What we've discovered, or what Transition US has discovered at looking at the transition movement across the United States, is that transition communities uh, uh, fade out of existence, not because they don't, not because they don't know that change needs to happen, uh, not because they're not committed to change, but because they don't know how to hold relationship with each other. Uh, uh, so they get pissed, and they go their separate ways. One of the things that's happening now in the transition town movement is that some of these social technologies related to art of hosting are being consciously brought in as a way to help people learn and remember how to be community again with each other. I think that, so regardless of whether we're using a, a disaster framing or a different framing, the work that we can do at any system and at any level of system that begins to help people establish trust, build relationship, share ideas, and decide what it is that they want to create together begins both to, to, to manifest a practice field for doing this work as well as get some good stuff done in the interim. Great, thank you. Is that, does that make any sense? I mean, is that... Oh, absolutely. And, and, and tell me what kind of work you're engaged in that, that leads to your having this question. Uh, well, I do most of my work corporately. 
Um, and so I'm working both at an individual level there as well as, a, as at an organizational level. Um, but more and more, my corporate clients are uh, starting to pay more attention to community and mm -hmm. starting to become more involved in community. And I want to nurture those connections because I see it just happening. Um, I think in, in part it started with the notion of being a good corporate citizen and maybe even part of a marketing strategy. But I see it often much more than that now. Yeah. Uh, I think it's coming from genuine aspiration and, and a desire to connect and reconnect with community. Th this is what's so cool. I mean, just two, uh, uh, two related points to that. First of all, the, the whole Future Center movement in Japan got brought in through a business lens. And it got brought in with this notion that, that we need to create change in business and we also need to run business at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to change the whole operating system of the business, but maybe we can begin to create special places where different rules apply where we can step outside of role, where we can step outside of hierarchy, we can encounter each other in a different way that, that invites in creativity, that invites in some originality that doesn't take place within the overall culture. The other thing that is, that's really cool that's happening is that, you know, my, what I, what, one of the ways that I talk about it is that in Japan, business is still part of community rather than apart from community. And part of what's happening in terms of a reinvention of business in Japan is that businesses are seeing that they need to reinvent who they are through deepening their engagement with the communities that they participate in. But that's actually the, the, the key in terms of where their future lies. So they have to, they, they have to develop a new kind of, of permeability and a new kind of invitation to work in their communities to discover what it is that they have to offer. They're still going to be a business. They're still going to make a profit, but they're coming at it from this place of how do we actually serve community? And I think that's, I think that's incredibly exciting. Yeah, and it's something that I would love to see more of here. You're reminding me a lot of what conscious capitalism is yep. all about. Yep, exactly. Okay, thank you so much, Jacqueline. That was really interesting. Uh, we're just going to hear from Scott Hooray now. Hello. <laughs> thank you, Adrian. Um, thank you, Bob, for the excellent, the excellent presentation. Um, so I have a question that I often don't hear addressed when I hear fascinating talks about the amazing work that people are doing in the world, and that's how does it get paid for? Mm. So I'm really interested in this question of how does this kind of work get funded, particularly since your talk has made it very clear that it's of the most value if it's continuing on an ongoing basis. This isn't sort of a one-time or a temporary intervention. Um, that we're talking about, or at least the time horizon would be pretty pretty long and hopefully it would be permanent. I would think it would be a great benefit to a community to set up these kinds of systems and then keep them going. Um, so what what is the business model for 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 setting these kinds of centers up um, and for keeping these these centers open and these conversations and these programs going? Oh, it's a really good question. And and I will easily admit that the business model that I've been in for the last three years is totally unsustainable. Uh, uh, it, this, this work of the, of the last stretch has been work of the heart, uh, uh, which means that more of it has been volunteer work than anything else. And as we go forward in the work in Japan, we're looking at several things. First of all, it seems, it seems really likely that when we're doing this kind of community work, we actually have to do it by getting the work that we get paid for, we do elsewhere. And we have to get paid, for, we, we need to bring this work into other systems where there's a different kind of resources that are available at the community level. So one of the things that we've created in Japan is a physical future center in Ishinomaki called Kohaku, 
but the business model Kohaku is operating from is one of saying we will continue will continue to do as many individual contributions and and fee for service programs as we can. So we'll invite people in for trainings, we'll invite people in for different kind of learning events and do those on a fee basis that brings in some income, not a lot, but every little bit helps. That we'll continue to go out and we'll continue to use a combination of of cloud funding and individual sponsorships from business that are able to see that this work is important and they will continue to support it as well as going to whatever foundations we can find that will support it. Even all three of those together don't make it. They don't make this into a viable ongoing proposition. So what we know is that we have to take the same skill set that we use for the community level work and we have to use that skill set for services in business and government as well. So we put together a hybrid model that is grounded in community and grounded in the, in the reality of working in community but are reaching out to a variety of sources for support. That's as far as we've got and it, it, and it feels, uh, um, on the one hand it feels uh, uh, disconcerting because I would, like a, I, I would like a different level of predictability. Uh, um, so I would welcome other ideas about what to do. And what I notice is that when we work with that way, and, it, and it, at some levels it's working with a certain measure of trust, uh, um, that when we're working with that measure of trust, things actually tend to work. And what I've noticed in my own life is that my own life is pretty good, except when I start getting afraid. And when I get afraid, I usually step in and try to organize or manage it. And that's when things really go to hell in a handbasket. So the more I can kind of take a bit of a hands-off approach and, 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 and stay connected, of course, stay connected to my life, but not try to manage it or control it, but to trust that if I'm doing the right kinds of work and paying attention to what's going on around me, I'll continue to find the support that I need to make it work. And it's a bit crazy sometimes. Thank you. And if you have some better answers, I would I'd love to know what your what your inquiry has been around this and what you're discovering. Uh, I have no answers. <laughs> so that's, my, that's my brief answer on that. My inquiry around it is because um, yeah, I'm at I'm at the beginning of several different conversations about trying to create. Um, spaces um, like this in one way or another, you know, without mm -hmm. going into too much detail, but 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 you know, trying to trying to do related work or similar work to what you've been describing um, uh, with variations and yeah. and uh, so many brilliant, intelligent, skilled. Um, well-intentioned people working from a place of, of heart, soul, and authenticity uh, who are really wanting to step into and support this kind of work. And uh, it's just fascinating how little the conversation about the business model is had and how little, you know, people seem to have answers or solutions or are prototyping answers or solutions to that. So it's it's something I'm paying a lot of attention to because I'm stepping into this space and so far I haven't heard a lot about what is working for people. So any it just having the conversation is of so much value just to hear kind of what's working for you and how it feels and and what works and doesn't work about it is just tremendously helpful. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And as I listen to you you know, part of what part of what strikes me is that we're. I I suspect this is like brand new. Uh, um, I suspect we're actually asking the wrong question. Yeah. Uh, uh, that it's not that it's not a business model. Uh, that that what we're what we're experimenting with here, what we're what we're dreaming and living and yearning into, is more of a life model than a business model. Uh, I don't know. I, it, it's it's you know there's so 
one of the things that I need to spend more time uh, um, just sinking into is all of the work that's going on right now around uh, around gift economy uh, and around alternative economies. Uh, I, I part of it, all of all of the kinds of work that I've been describing uh, uh, are relational work, and and business models are inherently transactional. And part of the challenge I think we've got is that. Like I feel, I feel like I live in two worlds simultaneously. That I live in a transactional world. You know, I've got a mortgage. I've got, <laughs> I've still got college loans that I'm paying off. Uh, 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 I live in that in that monetized world, and I live in this relational world. So it's like, kind of like I got a foot in both. And even even in the in the leaning over into this relational world, there's the reality of this transactional one. And how do we? Um, how do we hold that? How do we, uh, how do we hold that level of messiness, and and just and be able to accept it in this sort of yeah that's just the way it is, uh, uh, and it's not a mess that we're likely to clean up. Uh, I think that's just one of the, uh, uh, and having as you said having having the conversation about this and being open to the exploration, to to see what what begins to. To, to emerge in that uh, in that messy middle is probably one of the really important things. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah that's a that's, a that's a very present conversation um, with some of the people that I'm in conversation with yeah. about how do we how do we be in this. Um, yep. and, um, what yeah, I think that conversation around economy is is a huge one. You know, if if we want to be showing up in a different kind of paradigm, um, then and we're working in an old paradigm kind of economic system, there's some some great there's a lot there to explore, <laughs> certainly. Yeah, so for sure. thank you. Thank you. I'll make room for someone else to speak. <laughs> yeah, and that also makes me think of some of the really good work being done in Brazil with. Uh, you know, Edgar Gaviria Jr. with Oasis Games mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. also Play the Call, where a lot of the project is actually supported by gifts from the community where the, the projects are taking place. So meals are provided for for all of the volunteers, uh, even boat trips and massages and the home and all kinds of things. And so there's something perhaps in this question as well is what are like separating out what are our actual needs here and what are some alternative sources for us to be able to mm -hmm. access that or to, to have that sense of generosity being tapped into as well. Great. So let's hear from Jennifer Shepard. Okay, great. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, you can hear me okay? Great. So, um, Bob, I'm interested in what you were sharing about harvesting and making the harvest visible. Mm. So I've been working in the field of visual practice as a graphic facilitator in the last mm, four-ish years as part of my uh, process facilitation work. And I've been noticing a number of different roles to play. Doing the harvest on behalf of the group, doing mm -hmm. the harvest with the group where we're co-creating and then enabling the group to do the harvest for themselves and mm -hmm. each brings its own um, opportunity and uh, new, new things that could come from it and I've also been playing a little bit with social presencing theater methods mm -hmm. and noticing others stepping in with poetry and um, I'm curious to know more about what you've noticed is working and what you've experimented with in the process of harvesting as well as the process of making the harvest visible um, when the community may or may not realize that they have at least a starting capacity for that. Yeah, yeah I, I really, uh, first of all, just deep appreciation for the kind of work that you've been doing and and your naming of those different uh, uh, 
uh, different stages and styles of engagement. Uh, um, you know, I, I just say a couple things. Uh, first of all, any time that we that we actually that we actually take a pause and and begin to look at what's going on in the whole system that's present in any room we add to the vitality of that room and one of my frustrations with a lot of what goes on uh, with graphic facilitation uh, uh, is that it it just goes on in the background and 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 people oh isn't that beautiful isn't that really nice that somebody is over in the corner uh, uh, creating that lovely mural. Uh, perhaps I'll go look at it sometime. Uh, um, and, and perhaps they do, perhaps they don't. But it becomes this, oftentimes it becomes this unused resource. I think that, that it, you know, like, like you're combining it with social presence in theater. What I consistently hear is that social presence in theater, because it happens in the middle of the room, actually informs the room in a really powerful way and informs it both directly as well as energetically in a way that sometimes other kinds of graphic facilitation doesn't. But I think it's not, I think it's both the medium itself and the fact that there's actually space created, a spa, a, a pause created that brings this, this, this sensing of what's happening in the system more present to the whole system. So I th I, I love I love the experiments that are going on with this, and I think it's something that we need more of. And I think the more the more both what you said in that progression of inviting more people into participation in the harvesting, that that's really essential, and finding the times to actually bring it actively and uh, um, uh, visit <laughs> to bring it actively and visibly into the room is really essential. I'm also interested in something that, that, that doesn't seem like it's played with very often. Uh, uh, and that is what happens after we leave the room. Mm -hmm. Because what seems like happens is that we've done, you know, we're, we're learning how to pay attention to what's going on in the room and making it visible to the room. But then we stop. Everyone's so exhausted by having produced the event that it's like, you know, six months later before they get back to it or whatever. And no one has no one has really come together to do the hard work of looking at the artifacts that have been created to say what does this tell us what's the knowledge that's present here what's the story that's present here what is it that we want to be able to share out to a larger group of people as a way of of giving off an aroma of as a way of of saying this is this is what the core of this work is really about and if you find it attractive if you like that smell please come and join us. And it's that next stage of making the work that goes on the room, goes on in the room, visible outside of the room, that I think we paid very little attention to, except, you know, except in some old conventional ways that don't work worth a damn. So we'll create proceedings, or we'll create a report, but it doesn't have a life and vitality, and it doesn't actually attract people in in the way we need to be attracting them in. So it's that next stage of work that's that's incredibly interesting to me as well. I would agree with you. I think when I am in conversation with the clients and groups that I work with, I at the very beginning position it as three points in time and three opportunities for creating value. One is certainly for deepening the engagement in the moment in which the artifact is created. The second is about cr um, creating an artifact that helps trigger the memories of that experience as well as the ideas. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people will tell you, oh, just looking at that picture, I can remember what it yeah, felt like yeah. to be in that room, right? Yeah. And then the third piece is actually that the artifact can be used to invite and enroll others in the conversation, which is yeah. just what you said. So I think when it's um, really thought of as a standalone piece, it has minimal impact. And if yeah. you look at combining harvest as a concept with all of the pieces in the cycle that you've talked about, how could we use this to build a relationship? How could we use this to continue the trust building process? What new ideas come up for us as we look and work with these artifacts and so on?
that might be able to continue to deepen these cycles that you, you speak of. For me, that's it. absolutely, yeah. uh, and I'm so glad that you and then I then I assume others in in your community are active in that inquiry. You know, part of what part of what I also set with is that like our our heads and our minds are are wonderful uh, wonderful little tools, uh, um, but they actually don't usually produce any breakthroughs. Uh, um, and it is. It, it's it's it, it's our visualizing. It's our it's our smelling. It's our sensing into a wider field where the breakthroughs come. So it's like when when the kinds of images that that you create become the basis for for leaning in and for exploration, then we've actually got a chance of seeing something new. So it, it's just I, I think it's vital vital work, and it just as you're saying, it, it's got to be brought into the center of the process rather than exiled on the periphery as as it's almost like when we when we do the things of, of okay we'll now bring in uh, uh, we'll now bring in a performer to perform uh, uh, to perform music or to perform this that or the other thing rather than bringing in an invitation and what part of what I'm hearing you talk about is using your work as an invitation which excites me a lot yes Thank you. And I think where you talked about a variety of methods um, and variety of spaces, that's where looking at a variety of ways of creating and sharing harvest matters, where the social presence in theater work may evoke a lot more of those senses more immediately and deeply, perhaps, than a visual method, and may work more for some people than others. So looking at a variety of ways of engaging the senses, whether it's also through poetry or music, would be um, other ways I could offer for us to consider as we work together. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just to build on that a little bit, it's even in the, the ways that we work with the uh, uh, work in the spaces where we gather. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I've become known as the, the Play-Doh King. Uh, uh, anytime I've got a chance to bring Play-Doh into an interaction, I do. Uh, um, because what I, what I discover is you give people a, uh, a lump of, of clay that they haven't worked with since they were in kindergarten, and they discover all of these things that they know in their fingers uh, um, that they haven't been able to know in their mouth. And the, and the, and the fingers and the clay uh, give them new things that come out of their mouth. Mm -hmm. So anytime that we're able to, to bring different media in, when we, uh, uh, when, you know, I, I think social presence in theater is always powerful for the people who see, uh, uh, who see the theater. It's even more deeply powerful for those who have been engaged in creating the theater. So it's like, how do we bring more of that kind of work into the uh, uh, into the core of our processes, rather than them as well, sort of existing on the periphery? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll create mm -hmm. the space now for someone else to uh, join the conversation. I appreciate it, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I think we have time maybe for one more question before Bob. You have to go catch a plane. Uh, we have one that Aki's no longer with us, but he sent in a question, and uh, he says that he lives in Japan, and that the story about being released from a future that they didn't want really resonates with him. And he also believes that there's a large number of people who that feels really true for. Uh, but at the same time, there seems to be a larger group of people who do not believe in that different future. What do you think would be needed to accelerate the change towards the future that they want? Uh, and could we know where we're really headed? Hmm. Or how could we know where we're really headed? The only way that I know how to hold where we're headed is as a mystery. Um, And the one thing that I've, I think I've more or less completely given up on is trying to convince anyone of anything. In, in all of my work, I work with the, the power of invitation and the power of attraction. And I'm even just in the last day, uh, uh, something, something new has been coming up for me. At, at Bricana, we used to talk about there being two kinds of work the work of waking people up 
and the work of sustaining the awakeness. And I realize that that is no longer sufficient. That part of what's going on right now is that there's a huge number of people who are awake, a huge number of people who know that the ways that we're that we're the ways that we are in the world right now are not working out very well for the planet, and they're not working out very well for us. But that many don't know what the hell to do with that, don't know where to take a first step. And, and so this, this question of creating conditions that support people in finding and taking that first step, in, in leaning in to what they know they want to do but don't have a clue about what it is, that that's, that's, one of the, that, that, that's an edge in the work that I want to be consciously attending to more than I have been. Where that leads, you know, we, we talk about, uh, we make the path by walking it. And I, I don't know, I, I really radically don't know what kind of a world we're building and how we're going to get there. Uh, um, I, I actually can't see it. But what I can trust is the more we're able to attend to each other, attend to having a, a good and a clean and a generative relational field with each other, that we will continue to sense our own way forward. And I trust that sensing. I trust that sensing that comes out of a, out of a collective process of, of looking out, having a gaze towards the horizon that we can see, and that takes that first step and that next step and that next step towards that horizon. That's the work of our times, I think. And maybe that's a good place to stop. With an invitation to uh, to yeah. anyone who's still online and anyone who's viewing this to please come and join us in June, because the the Summer Institute is a place for exploration and refining of these questions. You know, I don't think it's so much a place for answers. Answers will come as answers do, mm -hmm. but it's a place to be in a generative exploration with each other and knowing that it's okay not to know, knowing that 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 none of us actually know what the hell is going on and that we keep showing up to ourselves and to each other and we keep finding the way. So please come and join us. Absolutely. And in June in Tacoma, you're going to be sharing about a bit more about this, uh, your experiences in Japan. And also, are you going to be sharing a bit about your learning journey in the last few weeks? Ah, thank you. And, yes. Uh, what you've been learning in uh, the cool top or uh, yes, I think that what, what what we'll be doing in the in the case study case story that I'm leading is I'll be I'll be feeding it with some whatever stories are most current for me, but it'll mostly be an exploration of the questions and issues that we've started to get into in this conversation. So it's not it's not about Bob. It's about the exploration that many of us have in terms of how we create thriving, resilient community. Great. And so for, once again, if anyone wants to get in contact with you or learn more, they can uh, go to www.newstories.org. Or simply or email bob was, at newstories.org. Great. And this webinar will be available on the Alia YouTube channel and also on our webinar resources page as well for all of you joining us. And uh, thank you very much, Bob. It's been thank you, wonderful Adrian. hearing about everything. Yeah. And thank you everyone at home for joining us as well. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you. Good day all.